I recently watched a video titled, I quit believing in God after pastoring a mega church. Here's what I think about that. Hey guys, this is Jeff from That Bold Life, your weekly encouragement to help you live a bold life for Jesus. Now let's get started on my take on the video. Now I will start off saying that I don't watch videos like this very often. Coming from a unbelief background, you know, growing up kind of agnostic, bordering atheist, just watching things like this really kind of breaks my heart. It does. When I watch things like this and I see people who have left the faith or whenever I see, you know, students who are struggling, who are having doubts, you know, it really hurts me. And then to, to hear uh, Lisa Gunger's story about how she was almost like kicked out of her own church, it just, it breaks my heart for her and her husband, Michael. In the video, they said things like that they didn't drink or they didn't cuss, that they, they waited for marriage to, to kiss or to sleep together. And then she said when they got out of college, they got this amazing job working at this huge church where they bought their car and paid for their gas and paid for their school. And, and this church just really took care of them and, and their faith was strong, except they, they had a, a very false idea of God. My whole perspective on my faith has been a transaction. If I'm good enough or if I pray enough, if I believe enough, then I get blessings and I get a baby or a good life. It's not how life is. We all have this perspective on who was in and who was out. For Michael and I, that began to change slowly. You have to conform, and if you have doubts, you're a dangerous person. She actually says, if I'm good enough, if I pray enough, if I simply believe enough, I'll get good things. My prayers will be answered. The problem with that is we start to create for ourselves a false image of God and it's very easy for us to do. Even myself, I fall into this today when something doesn't go right, when something doesn't go the way I planned, when life starts to fall apart, when my parents passed away. When, when these things happen, I start to say, what are you doing, God? God, what, what, what are you doing? I'm serving you. I'm a pastor, I minister, I preach, I speak your words, I do all these amazing things. God, why are you not taking care of me? Why are you not doing the things I feel like you should be doing? Why is my life falling apart when I seem to be doing everything right? You see, the problem with that is, is we begin to create a transactional God. Right? We begin to create a God who simply, he does good things for us when we do good things for him. However, Christianity, to, to be Christian cliche for just a moment, is not religion where it's if I do this, you do this. No, it's a relationship. And how crazy would it be if I walked up to my wife today and I said, hey, I said I love you earlier. I gave you a kiss and I sent you a sweet text earlier today and you still haven't done those dishes. Right? It doesn't work like that. And I would probably have a black eye. Relationships are not transactional. It's not, if I do this, you do this. No, it's, you do things out of love. And the thing, same thing is true with God. God is not transactional. God, because you do one thing, He's not going to do another thing. And if you don't do this thing, He's not going to do that thing. It's not, it doesn't work like that. A relationship with God is not transactional. We read in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Our salvation, the grace of God is not transactional. It is a free, unmerited gift. It's a gift we could not earn. Nothing we could do could pay for that gift. So where are we in our spirits thinking that we can earn certain things from God? And, and this is the, the, the first problem I saw in this video, and it's not uncommon. I do not fault Lisa and Michael for this belief because a lot of us today believe it. Even those of us that know better still have a tendency to believe this about God that if we do this, then God's going to do this, right? If we pray enough, then we're going to get a baby. If we read our Bible enough, we're going to be blessed enough. If we tithe and give our money and we offer to charities enough, then we're going to get money back. Now, I'm not going to lie. Those things very well can happen and very often do happen, but they don't happen because we did one thing or the other. God, God has a plan. Right? And that's super cliche. Anyone watching right now who's not a believer is like, oh, here we go. I'm not trying to be like that. I'm not trying to be one of those Christians that's like, just believe and it'll happen. I'm, I'm not. 
I grew up agnostic, atheist. I know how stupid that sounds. But since I, I found Jesus, right, I've seen how true it is too. It may sound stupid, but at the same time, it's very often proven true that God actually does have a plan in the midst of our darkest moments. But the first thing I wanna say about this video that I took away from it is that they created this transactional idea of God, which is all well and good while everything is going good, right? Because it's going great when you're getting your dream job and that dream job is paying for your car and it's paying for your school and it's paying for your gas and you have a nice house. The problem is this idea of God falls apart when things start to go badly because she says they start trying to have a baby and they're not able. And around the same time, they, they go off and they visit these concentration camps and these areas where just extreme evil have happened. And they start to have this idea, how can there be a good God when bad things happen in this world? And again, coming from an atheistic past, I know that feeling, I know that belief. It's like, look at all the bad in the world. I've visited third world countries. I've experienced poverty and darkness one to one. I've been there in the midst and I know in those times you're like, how can there be a good God when there's so much devastation in this world? I don't pretend to know that answer, but I will say, I truly believe that God will not override free will. The problem is, is that man as humans, there are some evil people out there. We can all agree. There are people that just want to do evil to others and they are out there and God being who he is, will not override free will. Because when you override free will, there is no love and God wants even the most evil of us to come to Him and to know Him, to love Him, to experience salvation and to experience grace. God wants that for all people. I know how difficult that is to understand because if you have the ability, why would you not stop the evil from happening? But it's because God wants all people to be saved. But they had this idea of transactional faith, which is all well and good when you have your dream job and it's taking care of your whole life. It falls apart when your prayers are not being answered. And this is exactly what happens to them. They want to have a baby and they pray and they pray and they pray in this church that they're working at and the people around them start telling them, hey, if you just believe enough, right? If you just pray enough, if you speak it, it will come to pass. If you, The problem is it doesn't. And again, this is from a false idea of God because now their idea of God is being reinforced by those around them because the people around them are saying, if you just pray enough, if you just believe enough, if you just have faith enough, if you just do enough, if you just work hard enough, then your prayers will be answered. But the problem is they're not because that wasn't part of God's plan because God's not transactional. God doesn't say, if you believe enough, pray enough, you do enough, if you work hard enough, then I'll bless you. No, he says, it is by grace, it is by faith that you have been saved, it's not by works. There's nothing you could do. But their prayers were not answered. They didn't have a baby and they began to fall further and further and further down the line of doubt. And the problem with this is, is because, listen guys, as Christians, we are not perfect. And we, like anyone else, we suffer from doubt. And the problem with this is, is when we start to suffer from doubt, we need support. We need to be built up. We need to be lifted up and we need to have people to encourage us and to be around us. But the problem is they didn't have that. According to this video, when they started to experience doubt and when they start to vocalize their doubt, they began to be shunned and to be put down and, and this church was no longer supporting them. And, and if anything, it was degrading them because of their doubt. And the problem with this is this church is where their faith was built, right? They were Christians beforehand, but they were really built up and they were really encouraged and they were at their peak at this church and this church was the most influential part of their lives. So when this church started to put them down, it pushed them further away from God. And I wanna pause for just a moment and speak to the church. That's all believers in Jesus. When a friend, when a family member, when a Christian brother or sister has doubt, you cannot shun them. You have to lift them up. You have to support them. You have to love them. Because when you began to shun them, you were pushing them further away from God. You've got to draw them in and say, it's okay. We have these doubts. God is still real. God is still good. And God is still for you. You can't continue to push people away because you're just pushing them away from God. 
got to bring them in and show them the love and grace of Jesus because Jesus went to people who did not believe in him. He loved people in their doubts. Peter had doubts, yet Jesus came to him and said, Peter, do you love me? And he brought him back in. He made sure that Peter knew that he was still a disciple. Even though Peter doubted and Peter denied Jesus, we've got to love people through their doubts. Church, you cannot treat people like this. Anyway, that's a, that's a video for another time. But the way the church treated them pushed them further and further away from God until finally they vocalized their atheism. And at that point, it's all too real. You see, they said then that they didn't believe in this God. They didn't believe in this God who would not bless their actions. They do not believe in this God who doesn't take care of those in need. Can I say, just a moment, I don't believe in that God either. The God that I read about in the Gospels is not transactional. Because if he were transactional, right, if he acted only when we acted, when he, if he helped only when we did enough good things, then there would be no salvation for any of us. Because scripture clearly tells us that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Not one of us is worthy of salvation. It says that the wages of sin is death. It means that we are all damned to hell if it's based on our own actions. But thankfully, it's not. You see, the idea of Christianity is that we serve a good God that loves us despite our flaws, loves us despite our doubts, loves us despite our problems, our imperfections, our tendencies to go towards sin, our tendencies to evil and to hurt other people. Despite all of those things, God loves us and God sent his son to die on the cross for us. If you're not familiar with Christianity, this is the basis of Christianity, is that there is a good God who's seen broken people like you and me, that we have fallen short, that we have committed sins. The problem is the wages of sin, according to the law, the wages of sin is death. We were destined to die and spend eternity in hell. That was our destination. The only way we could avoid that is if our wages were paid. The only way the wages could be paid was with a perfect life. This is according to the law drawn out before creation, that according to the law, our sins could only be covered by the death of a perfect person. The, the problem is there was no perfect person because we are all flawed. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. So for there to be a perfect person, God had to create a perfect person. That means God had to put on flesh. He had to become man, come to this earth in the form of Jesus Christ and live a perfect life because there had to be a perfect sacrifice. And that's why Jesus went to the cross and he died as a perfect human being, as fully God, as fully man, to pay for the sins of all humanity. And then Romans tells us to accept his free, unmerited gift, all we have to do is speak with our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was sent to die on our behalf, and that he died, was buried, and he resurrected from the dead, overcoming sin and overcoming death, before ascending back to the Father. That is Christianity, that is the gospel in a nutshell, that God loves you so very much. So this, as I end, as I conclude the video, is my message to Michael, Lisa, and anyone else out there struggling with doubt. Wherever you are, whatever you've been through, whatever darkness you've faced, whatever darkness you've seen, however unfair life has been to you, God still loves you. God is still for you. It says he will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Even if you don't believe in him, he still watches you and he still loves you. He is still for you. He still has a, a deep sense of love for you. Even if you don't believe even if you hate him, even if you've cussed him, even if you've fallen away from him, even if you believe and you've simply messed up, he still loves you more than you can ever imagine. We serve a good God who loves us like a father. He sees you as his child and he loves you no matter where you are. That's what scripture tells us. That's what the gospel says is that God simply loves you. Even if you've never felt love from anywhere else in this entire world, he loves you. And not just a regular love like we love someone else because our love can falter, our love can fail. We can stop loving someone 
It says that God has an unconditional love for us. That He loves us no matter what. That He loves us despite our fears, despite our faults, despite our failures. He loves us through that. He has a supernatural love for you and me. And that is absolutely true. And if you want to know more about this love, do me a favor. Pause the video, stop the video, close the tab, whatever you got to do. Bow your head and pray to God. And simply say this. Pray it to Jesus and say, Jesus, today I believe in you. I need you to reveal yourself to me. I want to give you my life. God, I want to believe in you. I want to accept the free gift of salvation that you offer. Just pray that to God. Open up your Bible. Download the Bible app. Start to read and start in the book of John if you don't know where else to start and just start to read and believe in Jesus. Understand who this Jesus is. I hope that encourages you. I hope that blesses you. I hope at the very least it gives you a better idea of who we believe that God is. I pray that if you're here and and you're asking questions or, or you're agnostic or you're atheist and you just have some questions about why we believe this crazy stuff that we believe, I pray that you'll just keep watching these videos. I have plenty of them on my channel. Slap that subscribe button. Go watch all the stuff that I put out. If you have questions, leave it down in the comments. I'm here for you guys. I'll do my best to answer every question that gets put in the comments. Guys, I hope that if you enjoyed this video or at the very least you learned something from this video, you'll hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment down below, let me know what you thought of my video, what you thought of Lisa's video. Uh, anyway guys, I just hope you have a blessed day, keep living that bold life.